preach a very simple message. It's entitled, So You Call Yourself a Christian. There's only three times, believe it or not, the word Christian is actually found in the New Testament. The word Christian was not a word that early believers chose for themselves. You're going to see this morning. It was actually a, a term given to the first believers by the lost world. But through time, the name Christian became so well known that Peter, the third time it's mentioned, identified himself and those he was writing to as Christians. People of many different persuasions, including athletes, stars, cultists, even politicians, at one time or another, have claimed to be Christians. But, um, I'll, I'll be honest, what spurred this message way back in my first church, as a young pastor, was an interview um, that one of the reporters did with this new teenage girl. She became an instant overnight success. No, her name's not Taylor Swift. But the young lady that preceded Taylor Swift by many, many decades was being interviewed, and uh, I think she was 18 or 19. And uh, the reporter said, I understand you're a Christian. Oh, yes, I'm a Christian. And as soon as I'm watching this, a uh, little interview on the news, I'm going, you got to be kidding. This young lady, the way she undresses and, and, and parades herself in front of the world, calls herself a Christian. And as he went on to ask Britney Spears these questions, she said, oh, I was raised in the South. I was raised in a Christian home. And I remember at that moment, sitting in my living room with my wife, watching world news, and I thought, it means nothing. The, the name Christian means nothing then. And today it doesn't. And I believe my, my proposition to you this morning, in other words, this is what I want you to think about. It is possible to be a believer, to know from the scripture you're on your way to heaven, but not be a Christian. Not based on the three times it's used in the word of God. So quickly, go to Acts 11. We're going to look at verses 25 through 30. Number one, true Christians, at least in the Bible, true Christians assemble purposely. In Acts chapter 11, we see the very first time the word is used. Acts chapter 11, look at verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch, in Antioch. I want you to see in this very first verse that true Christians, and that's what the lost town the lost people called these people that seemed to gather every week. In fact, probably every night. And the first thing we notice in this first verse is true Christians assemble purposely, first of all, for fellowship. Notice in that verse it says, they assemble themselves with the church. Right. The very first thing we notice about early Christians is they had to be together. It was a supernatural desire to, to be together. I ask this quite commonly. I can ask you. You'll know the answer. If you've been saved in, in, in a part of First Baptist Church, the very first indication publicly of a believer starting to backslide is what? I mean, I'm publicly. Privately, you don't see maybe when they stop reading their Bible, when they stop uh, uh, witnessing for Christ. What's the first public indication a believer is backsliding. They don't go to church. They, they start missing church. Well, listen, that would fit with what we're being told here. Because in the first church, they had to assemble. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If you don't go to church regularly, if you don't go to church methodically, biblically, then where do you get your fellowship? I think COVID, we'll look back in, in eternity 
and in history, just <clears throat> and see, COVID was like a massive earthquake in Christianity. It, 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 knocked, it, it knocked the backbone loose of Christianity. Do you realize First Baptist and many other churches, good churches, have not recovered? Some did quite well, but in almost every church, we noticed some people got the idea, well, you know, we're, I like watching church. And it's not as important to be in church. That's probably not going to change, unless you have men who are willing to stand up and preach a message like this. It's become part of independent, fundamental Baptist thinking. Eh, I don't know if I feel like going to church tonight. Wait a minute. I know people that I have not meant to embarrass, but I've seen them out. They miss church Sunday morning, but I'll see them at the restaurant Sunday afternoon. Or they say, well, I didn't feel like going Sunday night, but they'll make sure they're going where they want to go. Listen, I don't need, I'm not talking down to my brothers and sisters. And I know there are valid times that some of God's people cannot be in church because of their health. But listen, when did we start thinking, oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Well, do you fellowship with God's people? Notice as we keep reading, that same verse says, and taught much people. The early church assembled purposely. That's what Christians so-called did. Not just for fellowship, but for fortification. That word taught means to be instructed, to be directed in knowledge. Every man and woman in this room, including this man, the man you're listening to. Every one of us as believers need to be instructed. We need to be taught and preach the meat of the Word of God to grow. If you don't get it, you don't grow. Now you may feel fine in your own heart. But when you go to a church where the Word of God is preached and taught, you're letting your body and your spirit be nourished and sometimes corrected by the Holy Spirit. We all need that church for me, and really, church for you should be an oasis, uh, even the midweek service. You know, it used to be that believers in America loved the midweek service if they could go. Some of them had to work because they were in such a filthy, dark workplace and world. They just needed to go to be bathed by the Word of God, just to have fellowship and pray for one another. Christian, are you a know-it-all? Not only did Real Christians assemble purposely for fellowship, for financing, but quickly, again in verse 25, for financing. The Bible says that every man gave according to his ability, later on in this passage, verse 29. But giving is a part of God's plan. I believe the Bible clearly teaches in this church age that God has chosen the local church to be the place where we disseminate based on how God's blessed us, our tithes and offerings. It's the local church, not a hierarchy, not the government that decides where God's money goes to God's work. Verse 29 said they gave according, every man according to his ability. That word ability means capability, uh, the potential, the means. You see, pseudo-Christians... People that call themselves Christians, now they're saved maybe, but they're not real Christians, not biblically. They don't care about being in the house of God on Sunday, Wednesday, or really any other time. They don't have the joy of the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. There's just a lot more of us. We're saved, but we're not going to church. And that's not okay. That's right. It's not okay. Not okay with God. And listen, again, you can be a believer. I'm not doubting your salvation. You have the Bible and God's promise that you're born again. But are you really a Christian? Because true Christians assemble purposely. Number two, turn to Acts 26. Acts 26. This is the second time that the name Christian is used. And in a very unusual passage. You see, number two, true Christians witness faithfully. They assemble purposely. There was a reason they came together. They needed that fellowship. They needed to be fortified by the Bible. And they needed to faithfully give. 
Number two, true Christians witness faithfully. In this unusual chapter, let me just move quickly. If you skip down to verse 22, Paul has been arrested. He's standing before some officials on his way to go to Rome. And um, the Bible tells us that Paul was made to witness uh, and defend himself in verse 15. And beginning of verse 15, 16, he, he says, I was commissioned by the risen Christ. In verses 19 through 21, he mentions he was captured because of his witness. And then in verses 22 and 23, he was standing there before these men, continuing to witness. He says in verse 22, having therefore obtained help of God. I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets of Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice. Now, brethren, Festus is a Roman name. He was a Roman official, listening along with Agrippa, which you'll see his name in a few verses. Agrippa is the non-Roman Jewish king. And so Festus, as soon as he hears Paul uh, give the gospel and mention the risen Savior, notice he says, Paul, and by the way, Festus says it with a loud voice, Hey, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Now that word mad there doesn't mean angry. It means you're crazy. Right. I mean, Festus didn't even... He said, man, what a kook! Where'd you learn that nonsense? Watch what happens. But he, Paul said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king... No, notice this. Right before this lost Roman official, he, Paul looks at Agrippa and says, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. And then he does what sometimes I've seen it happen, and if you're a witness, you'll see it happen too. Agrippa's on the spot. If this had been a private conversation, I wonder how it would have went. Because Paul, having knowledge... I believe through the Spirit of God, looks at Agrippa and says, you fully, completely understand this gospel message I'm giving. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Here's Agrippa, a lost man. And he's sitting next to this Roman official. And he's embarrassed. And he says... Unto Paul, verse 28, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. That's the second time the word is used. Agrippa is saying, in essence, brethren, Paul, Agrippa says, almost. Paul, do you think this is the place we should be talking about this? No, 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 no. I am not going to admit anything right now, Paul, some other time, not right now. Almost. Thou persuadest me to be a <clears throat> Christian. You see, Agrippa not only understood the message of a risen Messiah, but he'd heard this before. He, that's why he says, you talk to me like these Christians do. You see, brethren, and I move quickly. It's a shame today so many born-again people. I'm not talking about Roman Catholics and nominal Lutherans and, 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 and dead Baptists, Southern Baptists, independent that don't preach the Word of God. There's a lot of religious people and they'll say, oh, I'm a Christian. And there are even born-again people. But you see, in the record of Scripture, true Christians assemble purposely. It wasn't by accident or always how they felt. Number two, true Christians witnessed faithfully. It, in fact, it was so common that even Agrippa says, I've heard this, uh, Paul, you're not the first one. This is not the time and place for me. But I'm close. You know how many people today go to our Bible preaching churches and not once, not once. They can spend 30, 40 years and not only never have led anyone to Christ, but I'm afraid we now live with a generation, our generation, 
that have not ever once shared the gospel or attract. The only way this church is ever going to grow biblically is for the gospel to be preached to the lost people of Newberry County. Are we in Newberry County? Okay. I don't know how big that county is. Ed does. He's been all through every square inch. But folks, I know that if God wants this church to continue, and I said before Funkhauser came, unlike Greenwood, Eastside, where there are are 30 some independent Baptist churches, not including Southern. This is the only gospel preaching, Bible believing Baptist church over here in prosperity. That makes it worth praying for and begging God that He would send a pastor. But if all we do is amen the gospel in a church service, but we never share a track or talk to our workmates or our neighbors, then you know what? We may be believers on our way to heaven, but we're not being Christians. You with me? I, I read this years ago to you guys, and um, I'll read it today for the benefit of our guest, Pastor. But... Um, an Irish pastor wrote this years ago in Dublin, and um, he did a parody. He called it Ten Reasons Why I Never Wash. He decided to do a parody about washing in regard to going to church. Instead of calling it Ten Reasons Why I Don't Go to Church, he decided to call it Ten Reasons Why I Never Wash. Number one, my mother made me wash as a child. Number two, the soap makers only want my money. Number three, there are so many different kinds of soap, I could never decide which one was right. Number four, I used to wash, but it got boring, so I quit. Number five, I do wash on special days like Easter and Christmas. Number six, I work hard all week and am too tired to take a bath on the weekend. Number seven, people who wash are hypocrites. They think they're cleaner than other people. Number eight, I get along very well without washing. Number nine, hardly any of my friends wash. And lastly, number ten, I'm still young. When I get older and dirtier, I may wash. Number one, true Christians assemble purposely. Number two, they witness faithfully. And in closing, turn to 1 Peter 4. This is the third and last time the name Christian is used. And I believe it teaches us that, number three, true Christians suffer gloriously. Yes, true Christians suffer gloriously. We just went through this chapter in my first, second Peter Jude class. Do you know, <clears throat> Pastor, when brother, uh, brother Willis over here, he pastored for how many years? 25. 25 years in Hilton Head, um, when all men, uh, before men are supposed to take the title pastor, they get ordained. And at ordinations, it's a bunch of older pastors gathering to question the doctrine of a candidate. Did you know there's a doctrine taught throughout Scripture that no one really talks about, but the apostles do? It's called the doctrine of suffering. Did you know suffering? Early Christianity understood what it was to suffer. Um, and Peter will say, if you look at verse 16, 1 Peter 4, 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, there it is, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. <coughs> True Christians suffer gloriously. Now, let me make clear, the word suffering does not necessarily mean dying. In fact, the word suffering is a common word in our New Testament, and it means to be in pain, to endure agony, to be in a bad plight, to experience hardship. Well, if I were to step back and just take that general definition, there are very few men or women in this room that haven't suffered. Right. Now, no one's died. See how smart I am? No one's died for their faith, right? Right? But many in here have suffered. You know, the, what I'm going to do is take 1 Peter 4 and move very quickly through it and show you how suffering 
was such a part of being what was called a Christian that Peter identifies that name that is now 30 years old and says, yes, we Christians need to learn how to let God use suffering in our life. Very quickly in the first six verses, Peter tells us that suffering teaches us how to have the mind of Christ. Look at verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. God wants us to learn during times of suffering that we need to look at our life. Is it sin? Now listen, sin doesn't cause all suffering. A lot of suffering for a believer is not due to their sin. It's just due to being a believer. Sometimes just the way life is. Ba uh, listen, bad people suffer. He talks about how God wants us to have a Christ-like attitude, not just with our sin, but God's will. Verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. <coughs> Do you ever think about this? Suffering is God's way of getting your attention. Uh, three weeks ago, tomorrow, I never thought I'd end up the way I ended up. It didn't help. My son-in-law met well, but I'm laying on the ground. It took me 10 minutes to get to breathe, thinking I'd punctured a lung. You know, I was doing fine. Brother Willis, I'm fine. But all of a sudden, because of that freak accident, pushing my rib cage. It felt like it went through my body. It didn't. I'm laying on the ground, and it didn't help that my son-in-law, he meant well. Dad, men your age really shouldn't be doing this in the first place. Oh, oh, you know, I thought, wait a minute, I'm perfectly healthy. Ooh, that was the two we most painful weeks I've ever had in my life. I've had pain. I, I played football, junior high, high school, and college. Oh, I've broken bones and, and had a lot of pain, but not for that long. And during those weeks, I purposely spent a lot of time saying, Lord, I don't believe this is because of any sin, but Lord, I know you're trying to show me some things. I've got a couple days, Lord. I'm not going anywhere. I had some wonderful time asking God, is there anything you need to tell me or show me, God? But he also, you know, suffering tells us in verses 4 through 6, it reminds us about heaven. You know, when you suffer... This isn't the final place. Heaven's your final state. He then goes on to tell us that when we suffer in verses 7 through 11, it should affect the way we serve others. First, our prayer life in verse 7. And then our love for the brethren, verses 8 and 9. I love these verses. Verses 8 and 9. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without Grudging. I've said this before. Grudging, it's used several times, not often in the Bible, but grudging sounds to me like a caveman word. Grudging. But you know what grudging literally means? Complaining inside of yourself. It means you don't say it, but you're thinking it, and you're saying it in here. You know, this is hard for me, so I know it's going to be hard for you. But the doctrine of teaching, the doctrine of suffering teaches us that during times when we really are suffering pain or a, t a, a place of discomfort, God says, now here's what you do. I want you to get off your little pity party and I want you to go to serve other people. Now. But God, I do it now. Well, I'd go help her, but you know, last time I tried to love her, she, did, she never said thank you, wrote me a note. That's grudging. Remember, verse 1 says we're to, during suffering, think like Jesus thought. The whole time our Savior was suffering, especially on the cross, there was nothing but love. And the seven things that Jesus said from the cross. And that's how suffering should help us mature. It talks about serving in verses 10 and 11. Verses 12 through 19, Peter goes on to say that suffering should strengthen our faith. But suffering, verses 17 through 19, should cause us to be solid in the way we live. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? This next phrase in verse 18, Brother Coombe, every time I teach it, 
in class, I have to stop and say to my students, would you guys please sila this next phrase? And if the righteous scarcely be saved. If God didn't, by the way, no one else in the Bible, in all 66 books, ever says that, that phrase. Peter, the old saint, he's about my age, maybe a little bit older before he's going to get killed. He's been saved now over a little over half his life. And he says, listen, let's be honest. If the righteous scarcely got saved, and by the way, if it weren't for God's love and God's faithfulness, I wouldn't be here today saved, man. That's right. This isn't my perspective. This is God's perspective. And he righteously and rightfully says, look, if you're born again, do you know how you barely got into heaven? Yeah, well... I think it's a sobering moment for all of us. But he says, look, suffering happens to God's people. Don't you ever forget, if it weren't for God's grace and His mercy and His love, you wouldn't have made it. Right. You Remember, you were on the broad path to destruction and hell, but God reached down and saved me. If, if, if God lets the righteous who are scarcely safe suffer, what do you think is going to happen, as he says, to those ungodly and the sinners who will appear before that righteous God one day? They know nothing of suffering. They're about to spend eternity knowing what suffering is going to be like. Aren't you glad you're saved today? Amen. Well, trouble comes to us, but brethren, it's not the end. He goes on to say, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. <coughs> that precious word commit. Let me read the definition. To place beside or near, to set before, to deposit or entrust. My friends, I'm closing. Listen. Listen. What do the lost do today when they're suffering? And they suffer incredibly. They have no hope. They have no Savior. They have no eternal life. We do. Amen. <coughs> it kind of puts suffering in perspective, doesn't it? I don't like suffering. You don't like suffering. But what about those we do know that will spend their life in such terror, lay on a deathbed and wonder what's going to happen to me when, when the heart stops, I take my last breath, and they don't know, only to wake up in hell. And in hell, they know the rest of Bible prophecy. They know what's awaiting them, the great white throne judgment. And then to be cast, taken from hell, which is so horrible, and stand before a holy God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will open the books, which includes the Bible. And they will be condemned for every evil thought, every action they did, cast into a lake of fire. By the way, after they watch Satan and the demons being thrown, they're going to the same place and they will spend an eternity suffering without any hope, without God. As one girl, female student asked me years ago, I was stunned at her question. We were talking about the love of God and the love it took to scarcely get us saved. And this girl raised, she never speaks. She's graduated now, but she's so quiet. And she raised her hand. And of course, when she raised her hand, I thought, whoa. I said, yes. Yeah. She goes, Brother Spencer, do you think God will still love them in the lake of fire? Brother Willis, I, I, I never had the thought. And I just stood there and stared at her. You know what was happening? A teacher was trying to go through all the notes and all the doctrines and all the Bible thinking. And I said, after, it took me a couple minutes. I said, the only thing I can tell you, and I got choked up is the Bible says, God is love. 
He won't cease to be loved because he had to send the vast, vast majority of human beings made in his image to a lake of fire. He doesn't cease to be loved. That's right. But I said that love right now can save anyone, anyone who will just put their faith and trust in him. And that's our job to tell them, especially during our times of suffering. Peter was saying suffering was something that lost people watched early Christians do, and yet they still shared Christ and still talk about his love. And listen, early Christians suffered gloriously. Are you a Christian? Or are you just a believer? If you're going to be a true Bible Christian, a, by the way, the word Christian means, the name Christian meant follower of Christ. That's how the lost watch. They said, you, you go through this and you sing these songs and you go, keep going to the same assembly and day after day, week after week, and you live that way. You must be a follower of the one who you proclaim. Are you truly a Christian? Are you a follower of Christ? Because true Christians assemble purposely. True Christians witness faithfully. We struggle there, don't we? And true Christians suffer gloriously. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes? I, I've asked Brother Don to come to the piano. I, did, I didn't just preach this to you guys. I preached it right back at me. You say, Brother Spencer, I know I'm a believer. I have Bible reasons why I know that if I were to die, I would go to heaven. I'm saved. Christ has saved me from my sin. But hearing this message, seeing it with my own eyes, I'm not sure if I were alive in the first century, I'd be called a Christian. God's spoken in my heart. Would you pray with me, Brother Spencer, and pray for me? God's spoken to me. Now, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. You know that. And you're a believer. You know Christ, but you say, God spoke to my heart. I'm afraid I've become a believer that's not really a first century Christian. Pray for me, Brother Spencer. Pray with me. Raise your hand. Sisters, brothers, if God spoke in your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Would you be here, my friend, without Jesus Christ as your Savior? I'm assuming, looking at the people in the room, you've heard the gospel, and you've probably heard it many, many times, but you've never accepted it in your own heart. By your own will. Preacher, pray for me. I'm lost. I already know where I'm going to end up when I die. And this morning, I do not want to leave this building lost and paying for my own sin. I need Christ as my Savior. Pray for me, preacher, as you close. Here's my hand, friend, lift it up. Please don't leave here lost today. You don't have to. Anyone like that, just slip your hand up, bring it down. As the piano plays, go ahead, Brother Don. I want to make sure you know, as church family, you can... Still come to this old-fashioned altar. Let's keep our eyes closed, please, as God's people deal with their Father in heaven. People are praying. One more stanza.
Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Thank you for being here. Visitors, you know anytime you're down, you're welcome to come back. Safe journeys uh, as you make your way back home. And uh, listen, church members, if you look around and someone's not here, give them a call. Just say, are you doing okay? Can we pray for you? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day, for your word. Lord, help those that were tenderhearted today and asked for prayer. I pray for them right now. They know you're a Savior, but Father, you spoke to them about being a Christian, a true Christian. Help all of us, Lord. And let no one leave today lost. Father, do what you must do to bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ. Bless us as we go our separate ways. We look forward to being back tonight and opening the Word of God, the book of James. Now, Lord, use us. Help us to remember to be real Christians. We pray and we hope to please you to that end. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God bless you.